Hi, Chris. Hello, how are you doing? Hey, where are you calling from? Um, South Lake, Texas. Ooh, that sounds like far away from where I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the middle, middle of the United States. Yeah, but it, there are so, it seems like there are so many Amazon sellers in that area. You know, Kevin Kings and the likes, uh, at least in Austin. There's, yeah, there's lots in Austin. So Austin's like three hours drive from me. Okay. Uh, but there's a small, small community that's like building here. It seems like more people are moving here. So. So are you hosting any meetups in your city? Um, no, I like go. I mean, I'm part of this uh, group on Facebook, like a larger group called Million Dollar Sellers. And so then the one. local guys that are here, we just arrange. I mean, there's like six or seven of us in the Dallas area. So okay. we'll arrange little meetups. But then I'm attending a couple others. Um, Nate Lind, if you're familiar with him. No. no he, what he does meetups. He's, he's more into the off Amazon space big time. Mm -hmm. um, so he has got guys that are doing, you know, seven, eight, nine figures, and they don't even touch Amazon yet. <laughs> so um, okay. interesting, interesting crowd to be around coming from like the Amazon side where it's like, you know, 90, 95% of sales are on Amazon. But guys, like yeah. they're not on Amazon yet at all. For me, so. for me, it's very interesting to be around different crowds than mine because mm -hmm. then you pull those ideas and bring to yours and you like see everything in a different light. It, it's yeah. very useful. Yeah. Especially when, you know how it is, you start your entrepreneurship journey and you care only about the money in the beginning. Yeah. And then yeah. you go and go and go and then you have a comfortable life and then, and then sort of you start caring about different things, right? Like you, right, yeah. when you get somewhere else. So I'm curious, what's that something else for you? Well, for people who don't know you, I could just tell them that you sold the successful Amazon business, which you built very quickly in three years and you exited with like mid seven figures. Is that right? Yes. That is very uh, nice. Middle seven figures. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Um, so how has your mindset changed since you started and where so, you are? Now? Yeah, I was explaining this. Actually, I met up with that Nate guy this weekend, a couple guys for breakfast and we were just all kind of talking about our journeys and, um, Nate described it well as like two mountains. He says there's like um, two mountains of entrepreneurship. Like the first one is like you said, like it's just money, 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 you know? Um, and then, you know, you have an exit or you're successful there. And then you start climbing the second mountain and that's more like purpose driven. And, you know, I'm not at the top of that mountain yet for sure. Like I'm still trying to figure out purpose now in life. Like what, what do I want to do in the next 20 years, not like what do I want to do tomorrow to make money. Um, and so when he said, like, once you get to that mountain, he said, then almost like the two sets of entrepreneurs are yelling at each other, like, Hey, like it's better over here. And they're like, no, like we haven't even made our money yet. So it's, we need to be over here. And um, it's, yeah, it's different in that it's, you know, it's more like purpose driven. Like I'm asking myself, like, well, what's the purpose of life now? Even, you know, um, I've got my two daughters and so like, and my wife so a lot of my time goes towards them but I'm you know need need fulfillment because I've always just been an entrepreneur in that and so seeking out more rather than just like playing money grab of like what's the hot item that I could sell I want to I don't know not change the world but I'd like to make something that will leave a lasting impression that you know my kids as they grow older will be proud to say like my dad does this if that makes sense yeah, I have two little ones too. And sometimes I think, actually, I have enough income that I could just, you know, spend the whole day just with them. And then, and I don't know if that would completely satisfy me as a human no, being. I yeah. feel like, yeah, I, ha I yeah, need more it's purpose. Part <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like no drive in it. Okay, I enjoy it. But after like 14 hours of enjoyment, now I'm sort of like my brain is like relaxed and empty and ready for something awesome, you know, so back right. to the laptop and let's create something new. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're saying you're still looking for that purpose. Do you already feel about where you're going to go or not yet? Um, not really. No, I, 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 you know, I've been, been doing things here and there and, um, I am finding some joy. I'm like helping other entrepreneurs now um, through a you know, 
essentially like a PPC firm that I started. So helping sellers like along their journey. Um, and so it like starts, it starts out as like pay per click, but then I see so many things they're doing wrong on Amazon. Then I kind of help them with that too. There's some fulfillment there, um, but it's like lacking in that. Um, I don't know. You get, you get like a, Oh, like, thanks. Thanks for helping me. Like, this is awesome. I'm doing, and you see them doing well. And then they, you know, they come back and thank you, but then it's not, I don't know. It, I want more. I want to, I want to have a bigger effect, right? It's mm -hmm. like, if you help someone grow from 1 million to 2 million in sales, you're not really changing their life that much. You know, That's I want to take, I, I would love to help. Like let's, as an example, if, I would love to go to high schools or junior colleges um, to kids where they don't understand like what they're doing with the rest of their life and teach them that entrepreneurship is an option. Um, Cause I think there's a lot of bad information, let's say on the internet. And then when they're at school, you know, school is not preaching entrepreneurship. And, you know, for me, like for me, I dropped out of junior college. Um, and so I didn't even know entrepreneurship was an option at that point. I just, I got offered a job with a decent salary and I was like, yes, I need to start working and make money. Um, so something like that, something bigger, you know, um, but I haven't, I haven't quite found it yet. <laughs> so, hmm. It's interesting so it you mentioned... Long. It's interesting you mentioned that at schools they don't teach entrepreneurship and I've been thinking that's a good idea before like it, mm. it's um, in theory you would want that everyone would be entrepreneur but I have since realized that there are like sort of two kinds of people there's the kind like us who are the mm -hmm. creators and then there's the kind who are implementers and the mm -hmm. implementers they don't like to feel unsafe or in the new environment you know usually entrepreneur works in the place where everything is undefined there's no rules we create the rules and that's why we are entrepreneurs because we love this unknown we're creating something from nothing right mm -hmm. but there's this other kind of people that feel completely unsafe and worried and stressed in that type of environment you know they like the safety the knowing so i'm thinking maybe school is doing the good thing for majority of people maybe it's just mm -hmm. you and me that didn't adapt to that you right. know yeah yeah and that could be <laughs> that could be the case too where it's just maybe there's not as many people like me and you that <laughs> i think there are but <laughs> i think there's a small group at least that are probably struggling you know to like what do i do and um <laughs> i think it's <laughs> something in the, someday to help them <laughs> i think it's in the dna i don't know these days they're calling like ADD, you know, I think entrepreneurship equals ADD definition a little bit just because we, you know, okay, I got a job at EA Games, you know, EA Games is mm -hmm. awesome. And then I yeah. thought that's like the best job ever. After four months, I was totally bored. It's a cubicle mm -hmm. after cubicle. You just go there, do the same thing. Oh my God, I just wanted to quit. I got a job at IBM and also, you, you know, so it was, didn't you have the same experience when you just get bored with projects very quickly? Yeah, it seems like so. Yeah, I was like when I was actually in the job world, uh, I used to get. I mean, my wife still makes fun of me for me today, but you know, I had like more jobs than you know her mother had her entire life. Her mother's now retired. Um, more cars too, you know, because I was always like the cars were always related to the jobs too. So if I got like a new sales job and they were giving me a, a car versus a car allowance, then I'd have to like rotate, right? Okay, I have a company car now, and then I switch jobs like. Now they're giving me a car allowance. I got rid of that company car, so now I got to get a new car. And then I would start a business, and that needed a truck, so then I would get a truck. And <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I was always just bored. And it seems it seems like the bigger the kind of like the companies you mentioned, like EA, IBM, if you work for them, the bigger they are, the worse they are because they're so corporate and there's so many layers, and you are just like another like a number, right? You're just like a on the scale of IBM, like you're like they're going to do this one task for us, right? They're going to answer calls that are inbound and that's your whole job. Like <laughs> I, was like software, there. <laughs> yeah, I was a software developer and they give me the task and then there's a team lead who explains exactly what to do. So my mm -hmm. job is just like repeat what he said. <laughs> it's yeah, just, like no creativity. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, you know, in coding, it's the whole joy of, you know, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. Are you technical? Because you, I think the company we founded, is that a software? Is there a software attached? Oh, long story. <laughs> okay. We started as a, so I started as a pay-per-click agency because as I was growing my business that I, the brand that I sold, um, I was 
one of the things I found early on was, you know, in, in the like beginning of my journey, 2015, you could bid on anything closely related to your product. Um, like for example, I was in the baby niche. You could bid on something just like baby, you know, and that was it was converting and for very cheap. And so I found like if you just throw a ton of money at pay per click, you kind of don't need anything else. Um, and so I've never done any like you know, launch services, giveaway services, all that. Just it was all pay per click. And so I found success with that. I was telling people I knew about it, and they eventually were like, "Well, do you want to just manage it for me?" So I. So I had a full-time job. <laughs> I'm growing up. My business, my brand was already like doing multiple seven figures. And then I started taking on people's like pay-per-click as like an agency. And so that was the one task that in my own business where I hadn't really outsourced it. That was still like a daily task um, to, to a virtual assistant. Wasn't doing it yet. And so in my head, I was like, rather than hire someone, I said, let me build a software, right? To like automate this for me and my clients. And so, yeah, I went through a couple of years and a couple hundred thousand dollars and um, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> found out that, you know, I didn't know anything about, like, I'm not the programmer, I'm not technical. And so that was a, that was a mistake for me because I just kept on throwing money at the problem when it was like, I should have probably found a partner to do the technical side. Um, and then, you know, in last December, it was like to a point where basically I would ask them to upgrade one thing on the software and then like three things would break. And it was coming down to all my friends and all my clients and stuff were like contacting me. And you know, I, I, it was, it was almost going to mess with my reputation. And so I didn't want that to happen. So I decided, I said, you know, let me just kind of like take back on these core clients. Um, and the rest of them I referred to like another service essentially. And so now I, since then, since last December, I've just been like back to the PPC agency model. Um, okay. And I found, you know, there's some things that obviously software has some advantages because it can automate things um, that are redundant, but then there's some things where the software could never catch what I'm catching with like the human interaction. So I believe both have their, like their places, you know, in the Amazon PPC world. You know, because now, well, you sort of have an advantage if you would try all of these existing tools. Well, not all of them. There's a lot. Yeah, but so <laughs> let's say you try like 20. Because you have so much experience with PPC, you would know which one is the better one. And then mm -hmm. sort of white label that for your customers. You know, just basically use someone else's creation that you select is the good one because you have a knowledge to choose, right? Yeah, what I've done now is I, so I spent... Like we spent like 125,000, I think, on my PPC pal, the software, and I've now spent about $500 on Excel macros. And it actually does more than the <laughs> software ever did, literally. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then I still have that final, that final human interaction with every like pay-per-click report before we upload it back for the changes. And so it's, you know, it's, it's doing more stuff than my software, which I was very particular about it. So I, I don't believe in like setting, you should not just say, I want to target this ACOS. That's the worst thing you can do in the Amazon world. <laughs> so um, you can, like, I can guarantee you, like, if you want 10% ACOS, I can get you that, but you'll probably have two sales a month. Hmm. That's an interesting point of view. If the softwares allow you to target just the A cost, I think you're going to ruin. And I've seen it over and over happen where like you ruin not just your campaigns, but your whole account where sales slow down right dramatically because of it. And so I've tried several of them, but I'm, I'm just very particular right about the way I like manage things now and look at it. And um, I saw even flaws in my own software, right? When the software was doing, cause it's like, you can't catch things. And so, um, I just essentially the, the way I, I, I like the way I do it. Um, but there's still, there's still stuff that like, I can't like, there's some of these right softwares that are saying to like put one keyword per campaign, you know, I could never do that as a human. Um, when a client comes to me and they've got 8,000 SKUs in their catalog, you know, wow, that pretty sure adds to complexity of everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, I, and I don't, I don't, you know, it, it has a need, like certain keywords, um, 
but you know, there's stuff like that I can do, but I, I still, I really like the way um, I look at things now and it's, it's, it works well for the clients too. So, so yeah. that means you mentioned the 8,000 SKUs. So are all your clients pretty much big clients like that? Yeah. So um, the smallest one does, I think 1.5 million on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, oh no, actually I'm helping, I'm helping one client right now. That's like, brand new for some reason they just really wanted me to help them um but aside from from them i'm do uh it's like 1.5 million is the, the smallest and then um the largest one is doing like two million a month okay but to manage all that you can't do it yourself right you have a team and team no is i'm doing it doing it myself believe you are, it or not with the, you are yeah, doing it yourself so, i mean i have i have an assistant that helps um do other things but as far as like the actual optimizations i've got me and my excel macros so um, uh -huh. they'll Just go through and they'll essentially like they'll do what i want them to do to each client's report and then it highlights you know each change that it's made and then i review those changes myself so it's really me like scrolling through these reports and then you know put them back into a folder and then those get uploaded you know, back to so are these micros pulling on the APIs at all or just uh, getting reports? Like what's the macro is doing? Um, really kind of, you know, they're not pulling the reports. So we download, you know, all the reports um, because we also like, you know, certain, certain dates for certain clients. So as an example, right, if your products are more expensive, uh, let's say you sell a $200 item, right? And you've spent, thirty dollars in the last week well all of a sudden amazon gives you a two hundred dollar sale right uh at the end of seven days uh, because they, they say the attribution window goes up to seven days but it really goes up to ten if you track it okay so for ten days a sale can come in at that two hundred dollar and what if they bought two and you have a four hundred dollar sale that you didn't know about but you might have paused that word right because you had thirty forty fifty dollars in spend but all of a sudden that turns into a twenty five percent a cost keyword right and so the larger the um, the larger the product costs, the further you should kind of look back and not include those previous days. Um, so we download them, you know, for each client based on their product costs and everything. And then the macros really go through, and you know, based on essentially product specific for each client, how I want the reports to be optimized. They're optimized with the macros they're highlighted and then they essentially sort also. So they're optimized, highlighted and sorted. So you know what, this brings me to an interesting question. So do you still find joy in doing the day-to-day -day work like that? Sort of, you sort of still kind of like have a job, right? Because you do something yourself. You didn't create a system. Are you hoping to create a system from that? And that's like a beginning stage? Or you enjoy doing that? Maybe on, you're well, also the implementer kind. Yeah, so I, I um, you know, I was completely like nothing to do towards the end of, right when I sold my business. I mean, even when I had my business, I was working like a couple hours a day, a couple days a week. Um, so everything was very, odd, especially once I built, right, the pay-per-click software and all that. I had nothing to do but, you know, wire money to China um, and then approve. Like, so I would get an email of like, here's what we're shipping to Amazon this week, approve or deny. And so, you know, I, I'm very like that systematic where it's like I want to automate everything. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that, like you said, or you just can't, I mean, I was like essentially retired at 34 years old. So that didn't work either. Um, <laughs> yeah. and so I looked at what, you know, what am I going to do with my time? So I was like, I was like trading the stock market, doing all this stuff. And, um, and I was just like, just like, why, like, why am I wasting my time when I have all this talent over on Amazon, you know? Um, and so no, I, I'm not gonna like completely automate it. So I have no job because I found that to be like, I don't, um, I don't enjoy that because I, I feel like, like if you, if you automate your business to a point where you don't have to wake up in the morning, which I had done before, 
Like I could, I just could sleep in and watch movies all day, you know? And it's like, uh, if you do that, you have this like almost self worth of like, what is my purpose, you know? Um, and so I want, I want something to do, but I don't want to be like nonstop busy all day. Right. And so generally I'll work on my client stuff, um, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and for the first couple hours of the day. Um, and then, you know, so I, we generally all have Tuesdays open, all have Thursdays open, and then, you know, the afternoons of every day open um, for you know, brain time and thinking time and future ventures and uh, stuff like that. My own little Amazon business I have. And yeah. I like that you spend some time to think. And I picked yeah. it up from Jason Fried, I think, you know, from Basecamp. The, the, yeah. You know, when you start Googling on YouTube what to watch, he always comes up for, especially software founders. And mm -hmm. his belief is that you have to free yourself up completely just because you could have a thinking time. Or if you're super busy still, you should like sit and do nothing. Sometimes I just do my nails and think, you know, nothing else. It's just like for one hour. And all kinds of amazing things come to your mind first. What happens first is all the busy thoughts come in, you know, you're thinking, ah, oh, he didn't do that. Okay, I should do this. Write down, write down, write down. And eventually after like 20 minutes of that, it empties up and then there's nothing there. And then you, with a clean slate, like, oh, I should do this. And then you start like strategizing. It's like mm -hmm. you clear your mind from something that is super busy. And the mm -hmm. new, then there is space for that new thing come up, you know, and it's, he says it's important to do that every day, you know, so you actually create something nice as an entrepreneur. So I really liked that idea, you know, so I do my nails a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's me. For me, that's like my runs or the workout at the end of the day. So I generally like shut my computer off by like 4 p.m. or 15 p.m. And I'll either just go for a jog or go to the gym. And I'm always listening to like an audible book, but sometimes like if the book isn't interesting, that's when I like really, cause you have this like monotone voice going on in the yeah. background You know, it's not like music that's loud and obnoxious, just like this monotone voice that every once in a while you'll hear like a word that sparks a thought or you'll hear like one sentence where you're like, Oh my gosh. Like, um, I was, I was listening to one guy who has started built and sold seven businesses valued at $1 billion or more. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that just makes you think of like, what am I doing with my life? You know, like what am I wasting this time on? Like, you know, building an Amazon brand for a couple million dollars. Like it's not, you know, um, but you listen to stuff like that. And then every once in a while you zone in, you hear something and, and then that, that gives you like the, yeah, the free thought time. And it's like, for me, it's like getting that energy out. So like all the, like anything that you're frustrated about or anything, right? You're jogging and you're getting that out. And then you have this freedom, like midway through it, like 20, 30 minutes into it. You're just like this free flow thought that I get. So I enjoy that every day. It's like therapeutic for me. This is great. I, I do something similar, but I find audiobooks hard to listen. Like you said, monotone voice. I like podcasts much more because especially those which are conversational, like about mm -hmm. the SaaS apps, mostly I listen to like startups for the rest of us, bootstrap mm -hmm. web, you know, the guys from tropical MBA. Uh, so I really like those conversations and I listen, listen, listen. And then there is some thought that hits my mind and I basically phase out. Mm -hmm. So I don't listen to the rest. I just start daydreaming and you know, thinking about that one thing that they said, how that can apply to my business is completely different place, you know, and just like, then I phase out and don't, don't listen to the rest of the podcast, but it's still going in my ear. If I turn it off, my thoughts process going to turn off also. So mm -hmm. I like that. It's like an engine to start my thought process. So I really like this in the background. Then it's keep talking in my headset. Like I had this, um, thingy that I use I just walk oh, around yeah. with it. while I go shopping or come back or sitting in taxi I always listen to podcasts like that mm -hmm. so it's like my uh, my days go with those guys talking in my ear you know and I just mm -hmm. generating ideas <laughs> yeah I'm the same way where it's like I can't focus my attention on something even if like a book is interesting to me or a podcast there's no way I'm listening to like even like a 30 minute podcast without my brain going off like 10 times. <laughs> it's like, Oh, there's this, there's the, Oh, that's an idea. <laughs> so. Like I told you, that's like a DNA that we have. The uh -huh. entrepreneurs. It's some kind of creative thing, you know, but mm -hmm. the worst thing with that is that 
and I don't know about you, but me, I cannot stick with something for like to sit down and implement it. For example, there's a spreadsheet and I have to fill out the data. So after like 20 lines, maximum 50 lines, I am just, okay, I already went to check my phone. I went to, I just like forcing myself, my hands are shaking. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> like that bad, mm -hmm. you know, I thought yeah. I am good at creating something and outsourcing it, creating yeah. and outsourcing. Yeah. You know those sellers that hired uh, you to do their, um, you know, 8,000 SKUs for PPC. Do you think that's what happened to them? They're just, you know, because they're trying to come up with systems once they grow and then there's like no way they can manage it themselves. That's the reason they give to others? So two reasons. Like usually when a client comes to me, also I was doing that right before we started talking is like, I'll look at their bulk report, right? And I'll just, I, I'll either see a lot of wasted spend or a lot of wasted opportunity. It's usually one of those two things. Um, very rarely will I take on a customer if it's just like, I'm doing so good at this, pay-per-click, but I just don't want to do it anymore. Um, in that case, like if they really know what they're doing and what they're looking at, they'll usually hire a virtual assistant to do it, right? Um, because they could just teach them like their exact method, you know? Um, it's, I think when people come to me, it's because they, they don't have an exact method yet or they've been using someone else who's getting inferior results for them. Um, pay-per-click is changing a lot on Amazon. You know, they went from this small pay-per-click engine to the third largest in the world now. Um, and you see all the stuff they're coming out with, right? All the new the different types of campaigns and the different um, ad types and the different match types and the different, you know, ways that you can break things down. Now they're, they're allowing you to drill down better. So, so there's also then a lot to stay up on. Right. And when you're running a, a business that's doing, you know, 200 to a million, 200,000 to a million dollars a month, I don't think, I don't think your focus should be on pay-per-click. If it is, then you're not, capitalizing on your business, you know? Um, I would say that most come to me because they're either getting, you know, inferior results on what they, they're currently doing, whether that's themselves, an employee, another agency, a software, um, or they reach a point, right? They reach a point, like a breaking point of, like I'm spending, you know, so many hours a day on this and I'm still not getting it right. You know, um, and so, but yeah, very, very rarely is it just the, the time aspect because there's tools, right? There's all these tools now that you can, you can sign up for, um, to like take away the time aspect. But if you don't know, like, if you don't know what the inputs are for the tools, you're, it's a like garbage in garbage out. Right. So if you don't know how to set up the tool, if you don't know what, like your methods for optimizing your pay-per-click or any of that in general, you can't really even set up these tools in the first place to run it the way you want, you know, if that makes sense. You know, but um, there was one other PPC specialist that I've interviewed and he said his strategy is this. Well, there are headline ads, there are sponsored ads, there's this, 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 all these types of ads on all different platforms, you know, AMS, uh, D, uh, DSP, all of these things. And he says, simply, if you take one school and put all possible types of ads that you can run you are already maximizing the exposure and you're going to make a lot of money but i was thinking that's a lot of variations to split test and to watch and keep an eye and it's gonna like you are basically putting a lot of money into something that i don't know so what's your strategy on this would you say that is true or yeah um you know so for the most part like you can run sponsored brands um sponsored products are the majority of spend and sales or all my clients across the board. Um, I think it's because the way sponsored brands ads show, they're very ad looking to the shopper, right? And it's like this banner ad, you know, or the like the little product banner below the buy bot, whatever it is, but they're, they're just different looking versus like the sponsored products ads. They blend in very well and they just say a little advertise, right? And so I think for those reasons, um, they, are just the majority, right? Because they because they blend into the like essentially a shopper doesn't want to get served an ad. If you think about it, yeah, like they, they really don't, right? They want to they want to get what they're looking for. They don't want to be told what they're looking for. 
Um, so sponsored products is the majority of spend and sales. Um, and when I look at a customer, like if I'm, if I'm um, taking over a customer's account that's like butchered, right? So first I'll clean up what's there, just kind of get rid of all this extra spend that I see wasted. But then I'll look at, um, you know, their sales for the last 60 days and I'll take the SKU that has the most revenue because that's where you can make the most impact, right? And I'll start with sponsored products on that product because, you know, most revenue, most ads, most ad revenue is all from sponsored products. And I focus on the SKUs with the highest revenue for the last 60 days. So, you know, make the biggest impact and I just pretty much work my way down, right? And so I'll get all their SKUs going for sponsored products. And then like the next lowest hanging fruit is going to be like the sponsored brands, you know? Um, so then I'll start working on those. And then, and then there's like, always new experimental campaigns. And so what I do is, you know, because I'm managing multiple accounts, I can always like test one method over here um, and see if it works. And then test another method on this account, test another method on this account. And I'm spending very little and still getting sales on those, right? So maybe it's like all of them are like a break even, but this one method really starts to prove itself. Well, then I'll take that method and then I'll just kind of grow it across all the customers. That's the advantage to be a, uh, an agency. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you get to, um, you get to run through experiments faster. Um, and then, you know, show results faster essentially for clients too, because you have like 20 different experiments going on at once. And that, you know, the one that proves itself to be the best, you kind of go with it. Right. And every time I hear something too, it's like, you hear so many theories on pay-per-click. And so it's like, I can all, and I, I do have my own personal account. Like if I, I'm like super sketchy on like a, a something, I'll try it on my own personal account first, you know, um, versus clients accounts. But if it's just like a new ad type, right? You want to experiment with those because that could be super lucrative, especially in the beginning when nobody is using it. Mm -hmm. um, so like the new ad types, I'll, I'll roll out on several accounts. But if it's like, oh, I heard that if you turn off ads on Friday from midnight to this time, like, you'll increase your ACOS. And so like stuff like that, I'll try on my account first. Right. And then if it proves at all, um, then I'll switch it over to like everyone's accounts. But hmm, interesting theories. What about those little bit digits? You know, what I imagine PPC optimization to be is you open some software that shows you a list of keywords with number of sessions, <laughs> number of clicks, and then you decide which ones to switch off, like to negate this one, negate that one. So then everyone has this criteria. Okay, I'll wait for 1000 sessions and then click through has to be minimum 2.5 and then I'm going to like consider it good or not. So do you have those benchmarks that you use on everything or it depends? Yeah, they're, like, they're different, right? For So for every customer's account and each product they're, they're different really because like I said if it's a, you know if you're selling an $11 product and you get up to like I said like that $30 in spend and all of a sudden two sales come in well it's still right it's over 100% ACOS still right but if you are selling a $200 product and you spend that same $30 and then a $200 sales come in well that's a really good keyword still um, so each one has different like one time frames, but then also, you know, metrics that you look at those for based on a lot of things, you know, and so, and then it's also based on where the product is at in its cycle. So you don't want to optimize a brand new product the way you optimize a product that's a number one bestseller. Um, you know, you can probably be, so you can probably be more flexible in other words with the bestseller, you know, um, versus a new product. You want to take any sale you can. So you may let, a cost go longer. You may let, you know, sessions be more, you may let all this stuff, right? You have to be essentially more aggressive um, with your pay-per-click efforts too, when you're launching a product or if you're not ranking well, or if your star rating drops or, you know, if you've got new competitors coming to this space. So, which is like everyone right now, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, every, every single product is, is different. Every single client and then each client might have different, um, goals with pay-per-click. So I take that into account too. Um, and then it also depends on like your brand presence, right? So if you have a awesome brand presence off Amazon, um, that reflects in everything on Amazon, including your pay-per-click. Um, so you can expect lower ACOS then, and you don't have to be as aggressive on new launches because you have a brand. So, um, it really depends on client and product specific. Um, but yeah, you know, there's 
there's stuff that I believe in that some people don't like, you know, there's like, you should never have a price, right? You should never have a, or you should never have a keyword, sorry, that you say, I'm going to run this no matter what the price. Um, that's just hurting everything. Unless it's uh, your brand name, right? <laughs> no, even that. No. If, you're, if your brand name is not converting and it's at 250% ACOS, no. Um, there's probably 10 different other ways that you can get your ad to show under your brand name without bidding on that specifically. So like, no, I don't think that's the way to do it, you know? All, all of the data. <laughs> I'll ask you one more question. I don't have a lot of time in there left, but I have another question. You know, when I started doing PPC myself, I thought that the best idea is to find as many keywords as I possibly can. So I used all the tools and just got like 10,000 keywords for my, you know, dresses that I was selling. Mm -hmm. And basically it ended, up, it ended up to be so expensive that I couldn't afford to keep testing it. it. The test mm. was never ending. Some are like you're waiting for these 1,000 sessions to come on and some keywords never even get those 1,000 sessions. So they spend like five cents on that keyword, five cents on another keyword. And eventually it becomes like a big amount. You're losing every day just waiting for those 1,000 sessions to come so you could decide, make a decision. Mm -hmm. So what's your strategy with that? Do you start with like a set of, like a small set of keywords or a large one? Yeah, so I used to, right, I used to the, the blanket approach like you're talking about used to work just perfectly fine. Um, 2015, 2016, as I've evolved and, and Amazon has evolved and there's more competitors, you know, you have to eliminate a lot more of the junk on the front end. Um, and so for example, like if you're selling, let's say bed sheets and you run, you know, a reverse ASIN tool, um, you find 7,000 keywords, right? We have to start eliminating like, because you're not going to advertise on 7,000, you know? Um, so, you know, first things I do is I kind of go, let, let's just say you're selling white bed sheets. Well, under bed sheets, there's going to be all kinds of stuff in there, like Disney bed sheets, Spider-Man bed sheets, Elsa Anna bed sheets, all these like popular, you know, brands and stuff and, and characters for bed sheets that are under there. Um, and let's say you're only selling white and gray. So then you start running into, you know, pink and blue and orange and, all this color bed sheet. So you essentially eliminate all those groups and now each negative you add, um, you know, if you neg negate Disney, that might take away a hundred keywords, you know, and then you negate pink and that might take another hundred. So by the time of it, you end up, end up with like 2000 keywords. And so I'll take those 2000 and yeah, I'll put it on 2000. Um, but again, it's, it's all about your approach. So you can't just, you know, Brand new product, you're launching it. I'm gonna take 2,000 keywords and I'm gonna bid two dollars a click. Um, you will get destroyed, right? You'll just get like your wallet will get destroyed because um, the very generic ones like white bed sheets, cotton, um, those are going to you know get a lot more impressions, a lot more stuff, and and you're they're going to essentially like suck all the money from that campaign, right? Uh, and then the the other cool long tail stuff that might convert because nobody's really bidding on it, isn't getting enough attention. And so you have to be cautious of, you know, your bid amounts, your match type, you know, where they're showing up. And so, um, yeah, I'll bid on 2000, but I have, yeah, it's like a, it's like a slow launch up essentially, you know, with it. So you'll, you start the bids lower. Um, I always like, I always scale my bids, so you're gonna bid less, the least on broad, because that's just like broad garbage. Uh, a little bit more on phrase, and then the most on exact. Um, but then you have to be cautious with exact, because if you bid too high, like I said, on like white bed sheet, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's a very common search term, or just bed sheet by itself, you're gonna get all kinds of people, and you might only be selling king and queen bed sheets, right? But bed sheet can be, you know, twin bed sheets, it can be like all this stuff, you know? So, um, yeah, I bid on, I still bid on 2000. I don't bid on like 7,000 like I used to. Um, but I have a, I have a scaled approach where I like scale it up slowly to like waste the least amount of money to just get data back to start the process. Mm -hmm. But yes, when you start, you have to expect like if it's a brand new product, like if it's a seasoned product and you're, you're going, you can get your ad to like break even almost like, you know, day two. 
um, and then optimize it from there. But if it's a brand new product, you have to you have to expect a higher pay cost in the beginning, like losing money on it, unless it's just all like an amazing product that you release that isn't out there on the market. It's so unique that um, it's going to convert well. Um, so if it's not that, you can expect you have to expect a higher a cost in the beginning until you get the data back to because everything you think it's going to convert for it might but that that like might not be the golden keywords it might be like this random thing that you never thought about and you're like i would have never even you know bid on that had i not done this super wide approach to finding all these keywords so. hmm, very interesting okay i have like a hundred more questions but i will not ask them <laughs> because of the time uh, limit that we have all right well it's been a pleasure to interview you i'd like to ask you i guess a goodbye question <laughs> about the okay. mindset and things so for those new sellers that are sort of watching you and hoping to get where you are you know to be someone who's saying that you know i was bored and doing nothing and i could have watched netflix all day but i chose not to you know that you have a choice and they want to have a choice like that so how, what's the fastest way to get there like how can you what's the mindset should be is it all about the money or do i go 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 focus or like what's what works for you what can you suggest for the others i think when you're so when you're getting started so if i had known right half the stuff that i would like battle with and come across there's a chance that i may not have even started my amazon business in 2015 um so i think the one thing is don't get like over worked up here um, thinking I've got to do this, 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 this. It's like almost like the one thing, the book, the one thing. Um, I think I did that subconsciously. So it's like, you know, at that time in your business, what is the one thing you have to do that's going to get you closer to that goal? Now, well, first you need the goal, I guess, you know? So for me, it was, I heard uh, the Ryan Moran podcast, uh, 12 months to 1 million on Amazon. And that was like my big, that was my goal then. And I made that my goal. Like in 12 months, I'm going to do a million dollars of revenue. So every decision I made was like, is this going to help me get to a million dollars in 12 months or not? Um, and if it wasn't, I didn't do it. Um, and so everything, and, and there's different things for different uh business stages you know like if you haven't even picked your product don't worry about how to launch a product yet you know pick your product first you know if you haven't opened your llc yet like that's you know first thing like come up with a brand name so you know what products you're even looking for in a, in a niche you know um so so work get that goal in mind and then literally just only focus on what's going to contribute to that goal and then go so fast that like you literally can't breathe <laughs> because that's what I did. Because if I had stopped, if I had stopped and thought about the 10 things that weren't directly in front of me, that would get me to that goal. Like I said, I would have maybe been like hesitant. I might have not have launched my second and third product in like the second month I was going, you know, I would have hesitated a little bit like, Oh, well, what do I do if right? I get too many returns. Like don't, don't worry about that. You know, just, go and then that's and I, I like to work that way so i'll work and it's like well work 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 and i'll come up for air and i'll look back and i'll be like oh my gosh look what i did in like 60 30 days you know mm -hmm. um and so i think you know just just focus on that one thing each day and like know know if it matters or not because i think i think a lot of people get off on all these these tangents about worrying about certain things like i said like they're worrying about how to launch a product, but they haven't even picked their product, you know? Or they're like researching like, oh, who's gonna take my photos? And it's like, you don't have a product to take photos of yet. Like, don't worry about that, you know? Worry about the very first step, you know? Um, and then worry about that next step. Or, and then if you're along the way, people always ask like, when, when should I launch my next product? And it's like, the second you have money, launch your second product. Because if your first product doesn't work, are you gonna give up on this dream you have, you know? Um, so there's no like product number one isn't going to tell you like a magic time of when like that's going to like just Amazon's going to send you a notification like send product number two in. Um, you just have to go and if you have enough money, launch two and three and four all at the same time. And then you'll look back and you'll be like, oh my gosh, I launched four products. One's doing amazing, one sucks, and two are doing okay. 
Um, that's kind of how I work. <laughs> I think that's the, the quickest way to just go, you know, just go and be focused on that one thing that moves the needle, just one tick for that day. This is great. You know how I'm practically going to apply your advice right now? <laughs> I have a to-do list on monday.com. So basically, I'll create a new column, which will be called, you know, does it help my goal, the end goal mm -hmm. that I have? And then every item in my to-do list will get a check mark. This is very closely related to the goal. Mm -hmm. This was completely not. And then by that, I'm going to take a look at my yeah. 400 items on to-do list. And look, at, and look at your 400 items and be like, what is the, the one thing on there that... If I did it today, it would get me the closest to that goal, right? And that's just do that, <laughs> like right away. Yeah. Wow. This is awesome. And if you haven't heard the one thing, that's a good book too. Kind of describes the whole thing. Yeah, I've heard it, but I haven't read it. Like I said, this audiobook thing. Oh yeah, you don't like them. Yeah. Summary on YouTube. Um, there's a, I think there's a one thing podcast that you can listen to. Oh, okay. That, yeah. I'll so, that. so Keller Williams is like the largest. I think real estate broker in the either the world or the United States. And he's one of the guys who wrote the one thing. Um, well, he hired a guy, I think his name's Jeff Woods and Jeff Woods now runs the, he's like one of the higher ups at the, like the one thing business that's not Keller Williams. Um, but then he also runs the podcast um, mm -hmm. or they at least started them. Maybe there's even a different host now, but they have a one thing podcast that talks about the, they essentially drill down into like lessons from that book and then just like dedicate 30 minutes to the lesson, but like one paragraph of each, you know, okay. chapter. So it's a I'll good podcast it too. Yeah. I'll look it up. So how can people connect with you if they, if they want to connect with you? Are you looking for more customers at all or do you have any capacity? Yeah, no, I'm looking for, yeah, more customers. Um, you know, like I said, general, like I don't, I really can't help or it's not going to, it's not going to be in your best interest for me to help if you're like a newer seller, uh, if they're newer sellers, because it's just the, the cost, right? So I have a 1500, um, a month account costs minimum. And so usually that's like, if you're doing a million dollars in revenue or you're spending 10,000 a month on ads. And that's because I like to come in. Like, I don't like to take out an account unless I can at least save my fee for them monthly mm -hmm. or, increase their sales so much that it's paying for my fee. So one of those two things have to be in place for me to take on the new account. Um, but for those that are in that range, yeah, I'm looking for new clients. And so you can, I mean, you can reach out to me, right? If you're just looking for like a, I don't know, someone to throw an idea off of too, if you want. But uh, Chris at my PPC pal is my uh, email address for like clients or, you know, if you're, if you're really struggling, like don't send me questions like that you can find on Google. Right. Um, but I, like I said, I like to help people too at different stages of their business. So like you're really stuck on something and you can't find the answer. You can feel free to reach out to answer it if I can. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming to my show and I'm looking forward to seeing you somewhere at some events that we yeah. may be at together or something like that. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll say goodbye then. Take All care. right. Thanks for having me, Paulina. Bye. Bye.